So as Greg said, my name is Michael. I'm the CTO of Pulpo Media. We're the Comscore number one Hispanic-focused ad network for in both the U.S. and Latin America, South America. Uh, depending upon how you slice up Latin, or Latin in South America, we may be number two in a particular country. But if you look at pan regionally, uh, we are the number one reach network for all of Latin America, and we are by far and away the leading ad network in the U.S. I think we've got about a 2x lead across our competitor in reach for the U.S. Hispanic market. Uh, we were founded here in Berkeley in 2008. Um, one of our, our COO right now is a Hasselam. Uh, I was the first technical employee at the company back uh, in 2008, and I've been with the company uh, through uh, the last six years, almost six years now. Uh, it's been a great ride. Uh, we got acquired by a company named Entravision uh, last June, uh, which is the leading Univision and Telemundo affiliate for the US. So not only are we the leading uh, digital network for the US Hispanic, we're also the leading broadcast TV and radio um, reach provider for the US as well. So we can bring for our advertising partners a very broad spectrum of services and hit the Hispanic market in the uh, Hispanic consumer in the US across nearly every single channel that they're participating in. We do TV, radio, streaming radio, streaming TV, all of our digital channels, we're plugged into all the ad networks. You know, you want to reach someone in today's day and age, except for, you know, we don't do the Safeway Circular, sorry. Um, <laughs> but if you've seen a, uh, a Spanish language ad or a Spanglish ad uh, in the US, it was probably run on our network. So that's us. Um, I've been, me personally, I've been working in advertising technology for the last 15 years, uh, both you know, primarily on the, ad, on the advertising technology side, but also in the content businesses, uh, magazine, print, and um, analytics. Uh, so I've seen a lot of the innovations, the transformations, the deaths of various segments uh, as it relates to online advertising. Uh, and I gotta say, you know, the advertising world has never been as exciting as it is now. We've got measure, you know, from its get-go, we can, we can measure everything, but we can hit consumers through all kinds of different channels. We've got all kinds of data we can pull together. So, you know, big data is very much a part of our landscape. It's almost too much data at this point. And, you know, part of what I'm going to talk about is how you actually can make some of that data actionable and not just be swimming and more likely drowning in it. Uh, we don't have the problem, a lot of the problems that the prior speaker has in terms of data. You know, the online ad world has been measurable almost since day one. Um, that's both a blessing and a curse, and we can talk about some of that. Uh, this thing. So, what are we going to talk about today? Big data, um, how it relates to online advertising, what you can do with it, what you shouldn't do with it. Um, Looking at the advertising technology landscape, there's a lot of players out there. Everybody wants to take your money. Everybody wants to you know, be the best things in sliced bread for your online advertising <laughs> needs. And you know, a lot of them are selling snake oil. I'd say most of them are selling snake oil. So you've got to be an educated consumer, as a, both as a, a user of that technology, but also as a, as a procurer of that technology. How you deal with data. Data is everywhere in online advertising. People want to use it for all kinds of different purposes, but the more you use the data, the more you make it non-anonymous, the more you run into uh, you know, PII, pers uh, personally identifiable information, which is the death knell for any online advertising system. You run into regulations, or, or at least self-imposed regulations, client requirements, privacy issues, the, it's a fragmented um, market or regulatory framework that you have to deal with. You know, Canada is different than the EU, it's different than the US, it's different from Mexico, it's different from Argentina. It's a mess. So the more you can do to avoid PII, the better. And the best way to avoid it is not have it in the first place, but you know, all the data science and marketing people want as much personally identifiable information. So I spent a lot of time fighting the data science and the marketing teams and saying, no, you can't do that, or you have to do it this way. And finally, we talk about how you actually get out there and find your audience. You know, audiences are everywhere, um, but trying to find them out of, I don't even know how many billions of people there are online, is a tough thing. It's much more akin to spear phishing than it is to, you know, trolling for fish. So, and especially when you take a look at it from our perspective, which is finding the, the Hispanic audience, it's a, you know, you've got to be out there and you've got to build models for acquisition, for segmentation, so that you can spend your money wisely as you, you you know, as, a, as an advertiser in reaching those consumers and not wasted on all the people who are not going to understand your ad. 
there's no point in giving, putting a Spanish language ad in front of me. I don't speak, don't speak Spanish. Yet I work for a Spanish advertising company. I know it's a little bit of a dichotomy, but there's no point in advertising to me in Spanish. So what our platforms are designed around doing is how you discriminate between a first generation, a, a second generation, a third generation Hispanic consumer and reaching them effectively with, on, with the sites that they are looking at, with the creative that's going to be most effective to them, and the offers that are going to be most effective for them. So, online advertising basics, right? I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. You, we see an impression, right? I'm looking at the, head, the home page of the New York Times. There's an impression on there. Um, maybe it's an offer I'm interested in. You click on it, you come to a series of landing pages, and at some point, there's a buy now button, right? Someone wants to take your money. And in the beginning, this was easy. You threw up an online ad, you had a couple of landing pages, you know, you threw up, you know, your, your checkout form, and you lost a lot of money, you IPO'd, you became a VC, and the world was great. Oh, that's the wrong talk. <laughs> um, these days, it's the, still the same thing, but people are actually happy to put their credit card numbers in and check out. But the metrics, the fundamental metrics are the same. It's your click-through rate, how many people saw your ad and then clicked through to your landing page, and then it's your conversion rate. How many visitors did you get and how many of them bought your stuff? Those are the two fundamental metrics. But there's, I mean, you've probably, who's in marketing? Okay, who's done online advertising or been involved with online, some online advertising? Okay, what's the favorite metric that you use for, for handling your campaigns? Um, well, we actually run the campaigns ourselves. Okay. So uh, uh, revenue per uh, user that we have okay. is, is what we look at. Cost, uh, revenue, um, and then also then how many times we can monetize that. You, I mean, there's a lot of things to look at. That's the main one, right? Okay. Revenue, revenue per user for us. And there was another hand. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to the revenue data, so I'm looking at conversion per thousand questions just to okay. analyze it. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, there are metrics galore. You've got return on advertising spend, ROI, um, which is return on investment. You can look at net margin per user. I mean, the entire online advertising technology landscape has been designed around crafting metrics that highlight their technology platform in the best way possible for them. Not for you, for them. Right? They want to sell you the best A-B platform that performs best against this metric so that they differentiate from the 27 other A-B testing platforms and then they win. You don't win, they win. Hopefully you win in the process. But their metric may not necessarily be designed for your business case. So a couple of years ago I have founded a online optimization company. We looked at not having a metric worked great. We you know, tracked impressions to landing pages to conversions and we said at any stage in this process you as the advertiser can tell me what the value of that customer is and when it's important. No metrics needed at all. I don't care about spend per user, whatever you define it for your business. So this was an online education company. They are no longer around so I couldn't actually pull the creative assets for them but they were running a, a fairly su successful campaign and it was driven by fundamentally a coffee cup. They had a coffee cup on the ad, they had a coffee cup themed set of landing pages, and then when you got to the course catalog, they said, woohoo, we got a good user, they're browsing our course catalog. So this is great, they were having good success with this, and this was right around the time that GoDaddy started with their um, scantily clad women campaign. So uh, they thought they needed to spice up their creative campaigns and they wanted to sort of follow GoDaddy's lead or capitalize it. So they thought adding a, you know, a very good looking model to the campaign would really sort of help them acquire new users or, or new sort of students for this thing. So they, they, using the exact same ad, just with a well looking model on there, same landing page, exactly the same landing page text. Driving to the same course catalog page. And all they did was swap out the creative element of the coffee cup and the model. So, who thinks the, uh, the coffee cup campaign outperformed the model campaign? Okay, who thinks, so I'm assuming the other people think the model outperformed, right? <laughs> yes, or are we having a third option that I don't know about? <laughs> all right, so, Looking at click-through rate. 
That was our click-through rate for the model versus the coffee cup. 5x difference. Anybody want to change their vote? There's the conversion rate as measured at the course catalog for the model landing page to the coffee cup landing page. Who wants to change their vote? So the client saw this and said, this is great. <laughs> We're driving so much more to our course catalog. What's going wrong? Revenue is down. So they came to us and said, we need some help. We said, well, first off, dummies, you're not measuring conversions when they give you money. They didn't do this because their platform couldn't support it. So we figured out how we can make their platform support it. Uh, basically, we swapped out the logo on their checkout page with a conversion pixel. And boom, our platform can now monetize this whole chain, or, or at least track this whole chain. And when we did this, what, did we, what do you think we found? Any vote changes? <laughs> That's the conversion rate. <laughs> Zero for the model path. I mean, let's, I think there's two. <laughs> and it may have been me checking out, the, checking out the, the flow and make sure it all worked. <laughs> but fundamentally, back in the day, I mean, this was circa 2007, people saw a good looking woman, they clicked on the ad, they clicked on the landing page, they wanted more of that. They had a 100% <laughs> abandon rate at the course catalog first page. <laughs> their metrics weren't tracking their business. And that's a fundamental thing that you have to remember is that you have to design your metrics not by what your vendors can do, but what you need them to do. Your metrics in online advertising are what you live and die by. But you have to understand what's driving your business, how your customers come to you. Uh, a good example of this is United Airlines. Um, Whenever I book, I, as Greg said, we have an office down in Buenos Aires, I go there a lot. I always fly United. They like me. And yet, no matter whenever I do a search online for flights to Buenos Aires, for the next two months, I am bombarded with United retargeting campaigns saying, come fly to Buenos Aires. Now, they've neglected the fact that I've already bought two, I have two sets of tickets outstanding. They're wasting money targeting me, and yet they continue to do this. So United doesn't get the fact that I'm already purchased. I'm a premier member, they know me, they love me, and yet they think spending money, putting a really bad banner in front of me is worth the money. It's not. But for 80% of the consumers there are. It is worth it to do that because they did one little search, they came away. You, know, you have to understand that for each of your customer segments, there may be a different way that you want to reach them. Either through the loyalty program, through, you know, United would do better offering me, you know, vacation travel packages when they know I also go to Hawaii a lot every Thanksgiving. You would think that, you know, right when the fares are dropping, they'd send me this, come sign up. Or maybe not because they know my purchase history and the fact that I usually delay and then I pay way too much money for my flights. So maybe that's when they should be offering me the flights. But just like the, the speaker from Safeway said, you know, some of, you, some of the customers are coming in because of the circular, some of them are coming in every Sunday because that's what they've done for 20 years. Understand how you're getting your customers. It's super important and your metrics may change. There is not one metrics holy grail for the online world. There are, you know, for any one particular campaign, we may be tracking five or six different metrics, optimizing various audience segments, um, parcel down to a different metric for each segment because that's what is driving value for our online advertising partners. Finally, assuming that you guys are advertisers or working for a company who's advertising or doing marketing, understand your technical capability. Um, in the picture before, instrumenting the conversion pixel at the checkout was beyond the technical capabilities of the client they would never have gotten the understanding of what was going wrong had they not come to us or hired some people to do it had they done that they couldn't put that pixel where they needed to go they came to us we did it so understanding what you as a company can do versus what you're relying on your external vendors to do is a su is super important because that may influence who you choose from a vendor how you choose to engage with them and what metrics you're using 
Once you have this understanding, actually coming up with your metrics and coming up with your optimizations is easy. It's the scientific method. Hypothesize, you know, test it, analyze it, implement it. Very simple. The key thing is do it time and time and time again. What worked last month is not guaranteed to work this month. The internet changes, the weather changes, cust you know, customer behavior changes. Someone got the app or they're now on an iPad. So whatever you were doing on a desktop doesn't work for that person anymore. You have to be constantly testing, refining, updating your models, updating your segmentations, and updating your metrics because the world is moving around you. Part of that is also keeping a log of what's changed. That's not just the weather. You know, that could be your stores if you're bricks and mortar. Uh, could be external influences, weather, there was a blackout, right? There was a, a hurricane coming, so all of a sudden we had a rap, you know, massive spike in, in bottled water. Um, all these things are important to figure out what changed beyond just changing a thematic element of the site, putting out a new campaign. All of these are gonna, f are gonna flow into your analytic system and you have to be able to account for them because otherwise your, your system is just noise. Um, because there's only so much that you as an advertiser can do or I, what I can do as an ad network or what a publisher can do to control all of these things. But if you don't have the data to do that, then you're stuck because then you're just making inferences. inferences. And once again, repeat, repeat, repeat. This is a never ending process. It's not a once and done kind of deal. So as we start talking about big data, I was putting this presentation together and I, I found some cute clip art that had this nice, you know, idealized haystack. The reality is haystacks look like this. And those are the things that you are digging through to find signal. Hopefully you're digging through one haystack. I dig through about 27 between clicks and impressions and conversions uh, and user profiles and segmentations and third party data I get from publishers or first party data I get from, ad from advertisers or data that gets fed in from, we get feeds from uh, credit card companies to help us build our model. I am, swim I am drowning in data and that's one of my problems. There's too much data in online advertising. In the beginning it was easy, it was clicks, it was conversions. That's the only data you needed and maybe you've got page views. You, you could derive everything from that. I capture on the order of 50 terabytes of data, new data a month and I'm throwing, a, that's already having culled it all. So that's just the scope of data that I deal with and we're a mid-size ad network. You know, Google, I used to work at Google, we had data centers, um, multiple data centers just dedicated to storing log data. Data centers, big warehousey things. At least I give it to Amazon and I don't worry about it. I don't know how many servers I have doing it, but it's a lot of data. I can't actually even read it all to build to run a model. So I have to even just be selective. So the problems with um, big data, there are multiple haystacks and multiple needles and understanding how you get from a user the path through what haystacks you, gotta, you have to look at to find that needle or set of needles that's going to be important to you for your metrics, knowing that these may be different paths for different users. And your data is always messy. It's completely messy. Your identifiers don't line up. You've got data from your CRM <coughs> system. You've got data coming in from maybe online uh, conversion data from Google or from a website partner or a third party. The identifiers don't line up. So you do a lot of cleaning and half the time you can't line this up. Um, we, get, we get data feeds from the ISPs, basically Comcast, Time Warner, uh, AT&T, that allow us to then uh, match up web surfing behavior with our users. And we get, you know, these are the people, the pipes that the data flows through. And they're only about a 30% match rate, knowing that they're hitting us over those same channels. You know, you're not gonna have 100% alignment of your data, the all, even all the data that you put together yourself is going to be messy. From your CRMs to online campaigns to you know, offline purchase data, it's just going to be a problem. And then there's cost. I told you we have about 50 terabytes of data that we, we uh, accumulate a month. Just the cost to write that data, I have my numbers here, just to write it once 
is $4,800 a month for us, one time, to write the data. And then the storage cost of that data, every month, <coughs> over month of data that I need to save, is $6,400. So if I'm storing a year's worth of data, you know, that's, that's approaching you know, $90,000 um, a month, every month, to have t a historical 12 month of data just sitting on disks. You want to go further back in time? It gets even bigger. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, the movement from browser behavior to in-ass yep. behavior, um, some people have said it's kind of like we're back in the 1990s, right? Because you know all the data is fragmented again. But on the other hand, uh, you actually, for in-app behavior, you, know, you do actually have identifiers. You know who, who is who. It's just that it's not all in one place. Yes. Um, I mean, yes and no. It's it's a it's a it's a worse version of the cookie. Yeah. So is that is that making your job more difficult, or is it making it easier? Um, it makes it, it. It goes back to my data's messy point. It makes it completely harder because in app you have this identifier. You have a different cookie pool than you do in your mobile browser. So how do you figure out that that's the same person on the same device? And then you've got desktop. Right? Or you've got your iPad. Right? So trying to align all of those data points to the same consumer is a royal pain. Back in the day, in the old days, you had one computer. It was shared for the family. There was one set of cookies. People didn't know about clearing cookies. <laughs> uh, it was very easy to track people back then. Now it's, it's dramatically harder. And we spend a lot of time aligning cookies and aligning identifiers to try and match this all up. And probably most of my data science team uh, worries about that, of how we mash all that data together. But on the other hand, it is, you know, because everyone's typically logged into their, uh, their apps, then, you know, if I'm, if I'm inside Xfinity app, mm -hmm. right, you know exactly who I am. Whereas if, you know, it, you know a little bit less about who I am if it's, if I'm just watching it on the cable, right? I mean, the people who know all about you is Xfinity. Yes. And, and they're happy to sell that data. Um, Google. Uh, and that's about it. Or, I mean, Time Warner probably is on the same boat. Um, those people know everything because they're watching the pipes. They're watching the pipes, and Google and Facebook have your social login data. So they have a first party cookie everywhere. Um, <coughs> Gmail and Google Analytics uh, was you know, probably Google's best invention, you know, not from a technology perspective, but from getting a first party cookie everywhere. Uh, I wish I had one. I don't. I'm, I'm stuck in third party land. So, so what happens, let's say if I was um, following the ad on my mobile device, mm -hmm. but I actually went back home and I bought it on my laptop. So obviously you cannot, that's lost conversion. And they oh, might end up in a significant chunk because uh, how would you track the user? Right? Because maybe initially he's going in through your app, mm -hmm. but later on he probably just went through the website directly. And made the conversion that. Yeah, so that's uh, that's the attribution problem, okay. um, and it's it's much worse than the the context you've actually laid out. It's the simplest case is I saw an ad, I saw a second ad, <coughs> I bought it. Which ad gets credit for getting you over the purchase hump, and then it, it spins out of control from there. Is it in app? Did I see an app uh, an ad in Safeways? Uh, the coupon in their ad. I then walked into the store. I checked out, but I forgot the coupon. But my credit card is linked. I gave the loyalty card. Does the in-app, does the app get the credit, or does the loyalty card get the credit, or does the fact that I come every Sunday get the credit? Yeah. Right. It's attribution is the hardest problem of um, the online advertising world. It's actually why the company that I was talking about that I founded. Uh, earlier with the online education space failed is because we actually had trouble discriminating what came before the click and who got credit and how the different ways that our customers wanted to attribute advertising. Uh, we were in the, the last click wins world and uh, the people who were willing to spend the money for our platform wanted something different. And probably the proliferation of mobile technology has just gotten worse. Completely worse. Multiple browsers, you know, smartphone, tablet, tablet, multiple computers. How many? I mean, I'm assuming most people here have at least two computers: work, home, laptop, phone. I mean, it's a mess, uh, and that problem is only getting worse. 
So if you can solve the cross-device attribution problem, you have a $100 billion business. It's getting worse for third party, but not for, uh, for Google. Yes, or Facebook. What cloud service are you guys doing right now? Excuse me? What cloud service are you guys that 50 data? Uh, we are exclusively on AWS. Uh, no, actually, uh, well, we have some data in S3. Uh, we are currently have, we run instances, basically their highest storage instances for our Cassandra cluster, and we are actually moving all of our heavy log assets over to DynamoDB. Oh. Yeah. Is it not getting worse for Google as well with the sort of mobile app traffic versus mobile web traffic? The, the in-app traffic is um, hurting them a bit. Um, they're also a little bit behind the game on mobile app development, but that's why you've seen a big push for Google to become the login structure for those apps. And once they have the login structure, they've got the first party data and they win. Just adding that they also have analytics for mobile, mobile apps. Yeah, I mean, the, the analytics play and Gmail for always being logged in was you know, really their crowning jewels in terms of making sure they have that first party cookie everywhere. So let's talk about not big data, but let's talk about, what I like to talk about is smart data. You know, I've already pared down to you know, 50 or so um, terabytes of data. You only really need to instrument what you need. You know, you've got, you could, you could be, I could be saving you know, probably 40 or 50 kilobytes per impression of all kinds of random data that I will never ever look at. We save about seven to eight per user. Uh, for every impression, and then we pare that down afterwards. More importantly though, for privacy concerns, for data breach concerns, it's so much easier to anonymize everything on the way into the storage. As a data scientist, you really don't need to have, know that someone's name is Michael or Bill, right? It's not gonna do much good for you. You know, let the, the CRM system send them their, their happy birthday email. Um, from a data science perspective, from a deep log perspective, um, that data is only a liability. For advertising, it forces you, the more PII you have, the closer and closer you run against the opt-in versus opt-out um, self-regulations in the US, uh, EU privacy concerns. Uh, all of these things that you collect in a particular jurisdiction can turn into a privacy problem for you. Um, one, and one, the biggest, easiest way to, to solve that problem is to anonymize it. Uh, just a nuance. If, if you're pulling data from, say, Facebook, yep. um, that, has a that has that person's name. Yeah. It doesn't matter that you're pulling the data from Facebook as long as you're not storing the person's name? Gray area. Okay. Gray area. Um, the thing that is most important is from a technology perspective, are you using it, and can you reverse it? Um, so the fact that you the data is in the feed, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I'll let lawyers comment on that one. Um, one of the at, I'll give you an example that's very germane to what we do is we get a feed for pretty much all of the U.S. big box retailers of every credit card transaction down to the SKU level detail, SKU level detail that we use as an input to our Hispanic modeling. We actually go through a third a third party to do the online profile matching so that we don't have the ability to reverse the hashes. Right? The ability to go back from an online data set to that offline or that PII data set, um, if you can even theoretically cross that boundary, that puts you in violation of the IAB guidelines and you now have to become opt-in. So we actually use a third party to do the mapping so that we can say, no, we can't reverse it. And you know, I have to keep telling the marketing and the product guys, like, no, you can't move some of this data across. Um, you can't know that this particular person buys Tide every week, because I actually know. Right? But we can put them into a cluster of people who buy detergent, for instance, uh, as long as those segments are large enough. Um, you can screw yourself in this regard where you build the segments that are essentially segments of one uh, and reverse it that way, too, because that's essentially a hash. Um, but the thing is, is the law is written around your, abi your ability to theoretically reverse the data. Um, a lot of times you're going to get caught in a data breach scenario, not in the actual, okay, this was in memory but never made it to the log. So the data breach scenario is the one that I worry most about because that's what any when anything's going to get revealed or when you get audited. Um, so 
I think in that case, if you, not, if you take sufficient steps to anonymize it, you're probably in better shape. And is the, is the you know, linking your accounts on, on, on Facebook to like, you know, are you okay sharing this information with, is that considered the opt-in? Is that enough? Um, depending on your application, yes. Um, and depending upon the class of information you have, you may need additional opt-in. Uh, for strict PII, um, that opt-in notice is probably enough. Um, as soon as you start touching things like financial data, financial transaction data, um, medical data, um, or stuff that can get linked to that information, then you probably needed a, a more express uh, opt-in with the terms of service that you need people to scroll through and all that sort of stuff. So at least that you have some measurable record of proof that someone took an action. Um, in the US, a lot of this stuff is self-regulated. Uh, the IAB uh, has a program around this. They charge you lots of money. You self-police yourself. Uh, and basically, it lets you have a little icon on your website that says you're good. Uh, until you're not. Um, and once you are compliant, you can drift from compliance very quickly. No one's sitting there keeping you honest. Um, so as, as marketers uh, or as technologists, you, that's one of the things you have to always be wary of is are we drifting away from compliance um, because you won't figure it out until someone actually nails you for it. Um, and the last part is summarize your data and throw it away. That data is timely. Keep the summary data. You know, I have summary data going back five years. I don't need five years of log impression data. It doesn't do me any good. I'm not going to go look at it. I can't actually even go look at it if I had it because it would take too much time to run the model going back over that much data. But the summary data is interesting. Um, and once again, keep your, you know, throw it away and it doesn't become a problem from a data preach perspective. So how do we do this? You've got data stores that you need to throw all this stuff in. Uh, I mentioned to, I think you, you know, we're using Cassandra um, and DynamoDB. There's plenty of other solutions, HDFS, a lot of the stuff around relational databases. You can throw this into um, even S3 flat files. You know, pick something that your team knows how to work with and that your, the other components in your technology stack work well with. Uh, on the analysis layer, we've standardized on Hive and Pig as an intermediate layer. Um, does a good <laughs> job of providing our data science and our analyst, analytic teams uh, enough flexibility to get into the model. And with you know, something like Hive, it's as simple as writing a SQL query to get access across you know, hundreds of terabytes of data. Um, we use Hadoop for a lot of stuff. And it's really made a, a big difference in terms of how much horsepower um, or how much technical horsepower you need to crunch through all this data. Uh, we've actually taken it a step further. Uh, we use the Elastic MapReduce service from Amazon. And we've built a job management service so that our data science teams can schedule a job. It'll turn on two to 4,000 servers, run the job in two hours, and then turn the whole thing off again. So we don't actually keep any of our analytics services running 24-7. We turn them on and we turn them off as we need it from a cost optimization standpoint because it's more important for us to crank through the data than to have that on-demand reporting capability. So we spin up a lot of boxes and then we turn them off and, and we keep our costs down as opposed to having all that capacity running uh, and generating heat. Uh, and then for the humans, uh, because you know, everything above that I've talked about is really sort of machine-based. Uh, we throw things into Tableau, uh, but Pentaho is another good tool for you know, when people need to dive into the data and really sort of have a, uh, try and find what that you know, little insight that only a human versus a machine can give you. Um, and it's a pretty, a pretty simplistic stack of things. Um, there are open source tools available in all of these layers that are free. Um, and then you can also go up the pricing point from support and professional services uh, and training. So a lot of, there's a lot of vendors that are built up around offering you or taking your money for helping you use these tools. Um, so when we start talking about online advertising, there's a lot of players in the game. That many. It's an eye chart. Um, you can get this from Luma Partners, um, basically from an advertiser all the way through to the end consumer in a browser and the publisher. Everybody here wants to take your money. And they're all selling you snake oil. Or they're selling you their version of snake oil. Sometimes you need it. Sometimes snake oil is what you need. It's going to make something work better. Um, other times, it's actually going to make your life worse. Um, the key 
to understanding wh why I put the slide up is it's a complicated environment. There are no silver bullets. It's all hard work uh, in this space and all of these guys want to tell you that it's simple. It's not. Because their metrics aren't right for you. Their technology was built uh, to make someone else's business work then they, out, then they just sort of spun it out to a product. So it's critical that you understand how all this stuff comes together and how it's going to make your world better. As an app network that was acquired by a publisher, didn't you restrict your options to the number of channels you could publish to and therefore the number of advertisers that you could sign up? Um, no. Um, so what we have is we actually have three main uh, ways from a digital reach perspective that we touch consumers. Uh, we have our own. We had originally our network of direct publishers that we work with. So we have nearly every single major newspaper from Mexico <coughs> down to Argentina that's on our network in some capacity. We have a whole bunch of regional publishers, right? So that's one side of our business where we get this direct traffic from them. We either acquire. Um, all of you know a good chunk of all their traffic, or we may acquire specific geographies from those publishers that they can't necessarily monetize. You know, one of our best publishers is the leading newspaper in Mexico City, and we actually consume something like 85% of their U.S. source traffic to that publisher, and we monetize that. Um, we then have our o and own sites that we got through the acquisition. So all of the TV program sites, all of the radio station sites that we monetize all that. Uh, we also build a lot of specific local content sites for the various regional markets that we're in. And additionally, we have um, audience segments, audience pools that we've pushed out into all the major ad exchanges. You know, think Google, <laughs> think um, Yahoo, think uh, Facebook, where we can also find consumers that we've touched on some of those other properties. We can reach them also out through the exchanges on a preferential basis. So it's very much not helped, uh, not hurt um, our reach. It's actually helped our reach. So in terms of reach, uh, how much of these people are buying the same inventory? Everybody says they have 96% or 98% reach. They can't all have 96 or 98% reach if they're not using the same inventory. Bingo. They're all, you know, almost every single piece of remnant inventory is offered um, out through AdX, AppNexus um, at the same time. Uh, so there's at least du double offerings. Um, as you can tell, a compli this, this is so complicated. So everybody here, this is the, the sell side platforms. Um, their job is to fill your inventory. And what that means is they're running it out to every single exchange that is out there. So while this person has 96 reach, this person has 85, that's really a measure of how well they're connected, not how much of the internet they're seeing. So talking about this tech, more is actually less. Um, if you, the more of those people you have involved in your stack, one, they're all taking a cut somewhere between 2 and 20% of the advertising spend that's flowing through the platform. And they're doing this not for you, they're doing it for themselves. Uh, so to, the only way you're going to get that number better for you is to negotiate better. Um, and they're only working on small steps of the puzzle. The online education example that I gave earlier, they had actually originally had someone who was doing click-through optimization for them and a separate company doing landing page optimization. They were all both reporting great results. That's why they were getting worse conversions. Because they were optimizing, they said, oh, this ad's doing better than this one, let's run more of that. This landing page is doing better than that one, let's run more of that. Uh, but they weren't actually looking at the overall picture. So it's important that when you look at these vendors to make sure that your metrics, your conversion, your customer acquisition funnel can flow across all of them in a consistent way so that you're not working against yourself. Because you're spending money but not getting any value. And lastly, these are leaky systems. Not every impression that comes into one end comes out the other. Uh, industry average is between 5 and 10% loss at every step in the chain. So if you go to a sell side platform, you lost 5 to 10% of your inventory. You go from a sell side platform to exchange, you lost another 5 to 10% of inventory. You know, you go from an exchange to a creative optimization service, there's another 5 or 10%. I mean, that's what, you know, between 20 and 40% of your impressions you just threw on the ground. 
So it's important to make sure you have the tightest integrated, smallest set of vendors there because you're going to pay less and you're going to keep more of your inventory working. And you're also keeping them on the same, the, the, the smaller the set of vendors, the easier it is to keep them working towards the same goals. Um, I can't stress how important this is. Uh, you know, they're all out for themselves, not out for you. And you, it's one of the things you have to be super critical about is making sure that they're all working towards your goals. Otherwise, you're going to get screwed. And if you have consultants that you work with, or if you guys are technically adapt enough to, to evaluate these platforms, um, that's, it's, those are the skills you need in-house as you vet advertising technology partners. So this is a set of high-level, big picture questions. Yeah. Um, you know, when we think about online advertising, what we're really thinking about is kind of a spot market, right? Where, you know, someone, someone comes to a, a <coughs> web page and there's <coughs> one tiny fraction of a second. About 100 milliseconds. During which time <laughs> that real estate is going to be sold off to the highest bidder. Uh, I mean, yes and no. Um, we see our business is primarily, um, I would say, probably 75% premium direct at this point where we come and we acquire um, or we sell on a premium relationship basis where we already know what that what we're trying to acquire for that customer. Right. So I guess the, the question is then what, what are the contours of that market? In other words, under what circumstances does it make sense to have kind of a spot market uh, with kind of unlimited wide open uh, bidding? Uh, and to, to what and under what circumstances does it make sense to have kind of more uh, limited Markets with fewer bidders and uh, you know longer-term relationships with uh, with advertisers. And, and uh, follow-up to that is, you know, as as the previous speaker said, you didn't get to the point, but a lot of our speakers said you know, it's very important for you to know your customer. But the more layers you have between you and the customer, and the more entities and parties that you have, kind of transferring the the real estate, so to speak, to the end user, uh, the more difficult it is to actually know. Your customer. Correct. So, um, you know, what are the trade-offs there between kind of trying to get the, the the best price for your real estate, so to speak, right? And uh, and you know, trying to um, uh, you know strengthen that relationship and, and really get to know your customer. Right. So there's really like three tiers in the marketplace right now in the online advertising marketplace right now. There's premium direct, where an advertising agency or advertiser comes to a publisher, comes to a network like ourselves, and says, "I want to buy 10 million impressions." you know, $4.50 CPM, go make that happen. Um, then what you're starting to see develop now is the programmatic marketplace, <coughs> which is where the agencies can set up those deals through their trading desk platforms. A big, there was a big chunk in the prior, in the, the big eye chart about that. Um, and that's a more um, electronic relationship between the publishers and the advertising agencies and what they're really doing is the agencies have a particular audience pool that they've already set up through cookies through targetings and they're just trying to find those across all their preferred providers and then there's the remnant marketplace which is what you're what I think the, how the question started which is the spot market when all those two other channels go then you just put it out to the exchanges and see what you can get for it um, I think two things are driving the upper end of that market. So and that's also the sort of how the pricing is tier two. The premium direct is higher price than, than programmatic and then the remnant. Um, viewability, uh, which is harder to achieve through the exchanges because things kept getting, a lot of times get resold and resold and resold. Um, I think somebody back here had the question of, you know, 96% of reach and you can't have everybody having nine. That's because everyone keeps trading this inventory around. It's a little bit of a hot potato. Um, and you see that a lot in the exchanges. Uh, but when you start looking at programmatic and premium, you get higher up into the fill chain and you get higher up above the fold. Um, you get to more premium placements in the page uh, and you've got a better chance of actually uh, getting a better viewability score and that seems to be the current hot topic um, from the advertiser's perspective of asking for better viewability. That's easier to achieve in the premium and the programmatic worlds than it is in the remnant world. premium, does that equal more revenue? I mean, are you talking higher quality, or are you just seeing more titles? Um, it, it, it means higher CPMs. It means more make goods. 
Um, I don't know that it means more revenue. Um, it, it means more, more pain in, in negotiating with the client. Um, I think you're going to see the viewability requirements relax a little bit coming from the, the advertiser community. Um, you know, there's a couple of agencies that are pushing for 100% viewability at this point, which is an unachievable goal. 70% um, feels doable for various technological reasons. Uh, and you see you know, sites that are getting anywhere from you know, 5 10% all the way up to sites that get 80%. Uh, and the way to get higher viewability has, seems to be with going with a more direct relationship <coughs> with the publishers. So one of the things we're doing in our network is getting uh, sort of intermediate steps out of the chain in terms of supply side vendors and things like that so that we're closer to that actual eyeball when it comes across. So how does, how does Facebook or these other owners of ad inventory um, price it? Because if, if they want to put an ad on my Facebook page, I, I may be an ideal customer for, for your product, but not an ideal customer for the product of another company. So the, the value of you being on my page is much higher to you, but... Theoretically. How, how would Facebook know? Um, face, Facebook doesn't usually know. Okay. They, a lot of times this is put out for auction. And it's up to the advertisers, the highest bidder or the second highest bidder, depending upon the bid model, um, is what actually determines sort of who wins and what they pay. Right? So Google's is a, a second price model. Uh, so basically, you know, as the auction goes, the highest bidder wins but pays the price of the second, the second price bidder. Um, a lot of the auctions that we run programmatically, we actually use a first price auction. So you, if you win, you pay what you, what you bid. Uh, but that's up to sort of the relationships that you forge uh, as part of setting up your exchange. Um, on the premium side, um, a lot of times what we have is depending upon what the, what the client's trying to do, how exclusive a market is, you know, or how not filled the market is from our perspective, dramatically changes the price that we may charge uh, an advertiser. Right, so if you're trying to reach, you know, 10,000 customers in Fresno, you know, that's going to be a lot cheaper than, you know, 10,000 premium customers in San Francisco um, or not, just depending upon what, how our availability pipeline looks like. You know, we may be undersold for San Francisco, so we may give you a good deal. Um, so the premium, you've got a lot, uh, the publisher is a lot more in control on premium. And then on the programmatic and remnant side, um, the advertiser is much more in control. Now you can set floor limits and things like that, but in general, the, the advertisers are driving the, ex the, driving the pricing the exchange models. Now eh, we talked all about this already. So personally identifiable information. Um, in the ad space, this is your biggest fear because it's going to drive you towards, like I said earlier, from opt-in, you know, having to be an opt-in system, data breaches, there's fines, and, you know, there's compliance support that you have to do, and there's PR disasters. Uh, the last thing you as an ad network want to do is get breached and then have all of your advertiser pool data out there and say, you know, Clorox is not going to come back to you and say, oh, you're a trusted partner, so let's go run some more advertising with you. So you have, to be really com you have to be really careful with how you structure your data sets because all of these things come, can come back to really haunt you. And the more data you collect, the more problems you have. So here's some simple examples of, of PII. These are pretty obvious. You know, do you have an email? Do you have a name? Do you know what someone's age is? Um, you know, what are their you know, address? Um, An interesting example of some of these things are you know, how you actually acquire this data. So, um, who wants to give me some other examples of PII that they can think of? Bueller? <laughs> Credit card, financial? What? What is PII? Oh, personally identifiable information. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> That's a really bad one. You don't want that one at all in your system. <laughs> Anything else? Loca so, location's interesting. How do you determine location? Okay, so location, depending upon the source, can be treated differently. IP address, IP address geolocation 
is very gray. It's sort of a big target on a big map and it's more radius driven. Versus G GPS data is treated very differently in the regulations. So, um, you know, one of the things here is like if you've got a zip from a customer record, um, that's a, just that zip from a customer record is treated very differently because that's actually known customer data versus the zip from an IP address. Um, and so we don't use first party zip data. We use geo, IP geo database driven zip data. Now that means, you know, I can get down to zip plus four targeting, um, which is good enough for some regions. And, you know, if I'm looking at Nevada, it's a bigger circle. <laughs> um, in the EU, IP address is actually considered PII. So we also, when we store the data, we drop off the last octet, the last number in the IP address, just so that we can be compliant in the EU. Um, Does that imply that in the EU, zip or postal code is PII, the, if you're using the zip from IP? Um, no, because I can't reverse it. It works like a one-way hash. Um, and that's the really, in the anon in, in when you anonymize this stuff, the really the critical thing is can you go in the, from the unanonymized data back to the identifiable data? So if you drop it and you anonymize it, you can't go back. So we don't store, we store IPs, the first set of the prefix, but not the last part. Um, we store the, and if we have that, and we, that we can't then derive the zip from it, we store the zip that we derived at that point in time, and that's not enough to reverse it. Um, micro audience segments. Right, did you make a, a segment that is so small that you can reverse it back to uh, a user? Um, I, have to, I have to be on my data science teams a lot about this one. They want these super slim segments, like 20 people in San Francisco. <laughs> I mean, sure, that person likes this product, uses this app, and hits these four restaurants. Yeah, the lawyers will probably get on me about that. So we have an internal limit where we don't build segments smaller than a thousand people. Um, and that, you know, I have to keep reminding people of that. But also unique combinations of data, right? Fingerprinting in the browser is sort of a new way to think about how you get uh, around third party cookies being turned off. And one of the things you have to be careful about is does your fingerprint become too unique uh, and then can you reconstitute it? So, you know, this app, this Jeep, you know, um, this neighborhood um, using also on this network, you know, as long as you have enough people in that combination, you're okay. But when those combinations trend towards one, you start having problems. I think we've talked about a lot of this. Um, you know, avoid it at all costs, anonymize it, and the rules change all the time. Canada just changed their email marketing rules last year. No one in the US thought anything above it, about it because they were US companies, and now they're all starting to get fines. And they're hefty ones. Um, the EU is you know, constantly in the middle of revising this. California was looking at doing this. They, they scrapped that laws. The market, the regulatory frameworks are changing constantly, so be aware of it. And if you've got PII, encrypt it. Because where you're gonna get caught is in a data breach. All depends on how sensitive the data is, right? So, you know, if you've got social security number, if you've got financial accounts, if you're doing some sort of financial services system, yeah, maybe you shouldn't have the encryption keys and you should have a third party hold that stuff. And you one way hash it and use that to align things and you only have, you know, you know, the, it's really, that's somewhere where the lawyers should really be advising you. Um, my, my, my first inclination is not to have the data in the first place. Um, that's the safest, the safest approach. So, quick question. So, if, um, this is a very uh, loose question. I notice when I travel, mm -hmm. go to say Spain, I'll go to one website and I'll see ads about, you know, they're in Spanish. Yeah. And they're sort of saying, like, here's all this cool stuff to do mm -hmm. in Spain. I'll go to another website and you say, you know, it will think I'm in Berkeley. So yeah. Oh, here are all the great stuff to do in Berkeley. Now, both those sites have access to the same information. Theoretically. In terms of my location. Yes. So is that is that a conscious strategic choice on their part to, um, you know, run a different sort of ad campaign? Or is it just that they haven't 
decided to collect that data as to where I am. Uh, or they may not have used, decided to use that piece of information as part of targeting, and they're looking more at the content of the page for the targeting. Right, so if I'm, if I'm looking at Spain, a Spanish website, maybe I'm looking at um, you know, travel, a travel guide for Barcelona, I don't need to be you know, advertising Chez Panis to you. Right? I should be advertising a restaurant in Barcelona to you. Um, and probably in Spanish. But if you already have known that there's a customer acquisition path for this that knows that you're traveling there, maybe you had a tie-in with United, then maybe you have additional knowledge that you can use to target that. Even if I'm logged in, if I'm logged in to say the New York Times. Yeah, um, a, lot of, I mean, that, a lot of times depends on how the advertiser sets up their campaigns um, or wants to set them up. Uh, we make recommendations to our advertisers all the time and says, this isn't going to work or you should add these other sort of um, uh, aspects to your campaign in order to improve performance. But, you know, sometimes they think they know better. Um, but the reality is, is you know, you can't use all the data all the time in making your decisions. So you have to pick and choose what the, what you believe the important uh, metrics are for campaign success, um, and that's a lot of times driven by the advertiser. Uh, question on the BI stuff. So, <coughs> who has access to your data is obviously a good piece of this. Um, how do you balance access to the data versus ability to get stuff done? Um, we have a core engineering team that has somewhat unfettered access to all this stuff. Um, and then um, we make, uh, we take a lot of efforts, like I said, to anonymize data on the way into the system so that we can give the rest of the analytics team pretty unfettered access to the base data. Um, the, the proprietary data and um, the PII data, um, we actually keep, because uh, we have, like I said, we have credit card data that we use, we actually have that housed in a separate entire different business division uh, and there is no cross access between the online activities and that team. Um, so it's a, it's a quite literally a physical separation uh, as well as a logical separation between those duties. Like I don't even have, I as a CTO don't ha even have access to those systems and, they, and those teams don't have access to the online advertising systems. I don't, we don't even share um, Git repositories between them. Okay, cool. Um, so last topic that I had was, was how you find your audience. Um, this is what finding your audience looks like in this day and age. Um, you've got a big ocean and you are throwing spears at it. You know, we're in the Hispanic market. Uh, we reach a lot of the Hispanic <coughs> market in the US. I think we've got about 80, 85% reach through our various channels. Um, and it still looks like this. I don't want to be, you know, we have no intention of ever being Google and seeing the entire internet. That's too much, too much of a headache for me. But it means that we have to go build our segmentation models um, and so that we can identify these users and find them wherever they exist on the world because I don't control all of the properties. So it really comes down to selection models. What's important about this particular user that an advertiser is willing to pay for? Those selection models are channel specific. Um, looking at a, one of our TV websites, uh, TV show websites, that's going to be a different selection model, a different profiling model than what's driving, say, a newspaper from Mexico City that's, that's different from an e-commerce site that's a partner of ours down in um, Argentina that's different from a local tourist site in Chile. Uh, they all behave differently. They all acquire customers differently. And most important, these models are timely. We only keep 60 days of data. Anything past that is basically just making heat. Um, the models fall off. If we haven't seen a user in 60 days, that person's either cleaned their cookies, got a new phone, broke their iPad, um, or just you know stopped behaving the way we thought they were behaving. Um, and we need to figure out a new way of reaching them. Um, so once again, this is why we throw away data, is because the data becomes useless really quickly and just costs you money. So we have an interesting acculturation model where we can tell uh, the differences between a first generation, i.e. basically someone who just immigrated to the US, uh, from a second generation, uh, so basically a first, uh, someone who was born in the US with immigrant parents, and a third generation plus, which is someone who you know, has been here a while and basically speaks English as a first, uh, uh, as, as their native tongue. Uh, this model works, from on works online and offline. Uh, we use credit card data, we use census data, 
Um, we use geolocation data and we, can, we mash this all up for both a offline acculturation and brand lift model as well as an online targeting and audience building model. And we use it for creative selection and targeting. So we may serve a Spanish language ad to someone who is, uh, has just arrived in the country. Uh, for a second generation person, we may wink, our CMO likes to call it, we wink at them in Spanish, so a Spanglish ad. Uh, so we may throw one or two Spanish words in them and the rest of the creative is, is English. And then for third generation, we basically give them an English language ad, maybe with a particular color palette from if we know what their country of origin is. Um, and our system and our acculturation model allows us to do that within the context of both reaching the audience, creative, you know, picking a creative to serve them, as well as then driving them to specific language uh, landing pages to help with the conversion. Um, and then we update this model all the time with feedback that we get from our clients, um, both with conversion data as well as uh, focus group data. The data sources that we drive into this, you know, not only the credit card data, we look at the content that people are looking at, where that content lives. You know, hometown newspapers are a great source of this information. What language, not that their browser is set to, but the language of the page that they're looking at. Um, is it primarily English page? Is it primarily a Spanish page? What are they looking at in English? What are they looking at in Spanish? Um, and then also mashing that stuff up with uh, geolocation data. Um, that's uh, really, it's been a winning combination for us and we feel it's why we've actually been successful staying the, the number one Hispanic ad network um, here in the U.S. So that's it. I got through my slides. <laughs> and uh, I'll be around for questions if you guys want it. <laughs>